Chapter 2, Perseverance. We must be willing to let go of the life we plan so as to have the life that is waiting for us. Joseph Campbell. That's it. I'm doing it. I told myself one last try. I was in downtown Toronto wearing nothing but my white and gray camouflage cargo pants dripping with sweat. My friend had been holding the camera for more than 30 minutes while I tried to land the same trick over and over. I had gotten a few tricks on film that day, a nollie kickflip and a 180 heel flip, but the switch frontside 180 kickflip was the one I really wanted. Sometimes my left foot would be on the board, but my right foot slipped off. I just couldn't land it. I love filming skateboarding videos, and I still do, but I was aware of the risks. We were running out of time, and any second the security guard might come and kick us out. I rolled up to the stairs, focused and determined to land it. My wheels left the marble concrete, and in midair I noticed my board wasn't rotating all the way around, but it was too late, I'd already committed. I landed primo, all my weight on the side of the board with the truck's axle digging into my left foot. I immediately fell to the ground in pain. A few seconds later, I got to my feet and limped up the stairs, thinking I'd be okay. I wanted to give it one more try. I got back on my board, but I couldn't handle the pain. I tried walking it off, but it hurt too much. For 15 minutes, I sat there waiting, looking up at the sky, hoping and praying the pain would go away. Every time I got up and tried to put weight on my foot, I fell over in agony. Our skateboarding session was over. I had to sit on my skateboard while my friend pushed me back to the train station to go home. It really ticked me off. Toronto is similar to New York with its crazy drivers, so I sat on my board cradling my busted foot trying not to get run over by a car. Once we got on the train, we replayed the tape and watched my trick on the camera. We cracked lots of jokes about me falling. I wish I could show you the clip from the video of the fall that literally changed my destiny, but I accidentally taped over it. That's how little importance I gave it at the time. The way I saw it, it was just a bad fall. I'd be better tomorrow, ready to skate flat ground at least. The next day, when I rolled out of bed and put my feet on the ground, a sharp pain shot through my left foot. I fell back onto the bed, grabbed my foot and said, you've got to be kidding me. I limped around the house all day, but I was still optimistic that my foot would heal up fast. A few days later, I could walk on it, and I did get back on my skateboard. But every time I tried to do a trick, the painful pressure on my left foot stopped me. Finally, my mom convinced me to go to the doctor, but I only went as a last resort. I remember sitting in the office for what felt like an eternity, waiting for the physician to come in and tell me what was wrong. After examining my foot, he told me it wasn't broken, but there must be internal bruising. The way he said it, it sounded like no big deal, it's a bruise. I'd be fine as long as I didn't skate on it for a week. One week turned to two, and then two weeks turned into three, and then a month and I still wasn't better. It was at that moment I felt like my dreams were completely wiped out. Everything I'd worked for had fallen apart right in front of my face. Forget about moving to California, becoming pro, or skating in contests, being in videos, having my own board and shoe design. All of that was gone. Already I had skipped school, dumped girlfriends, and spent every last dollar on skateboarding. I had just graduated high school, but I hadn't even applied to any colleges. For the first time I felt fear. If I couldn't skate, what would I do? All the rage rose up in me and I threw things across the room. I spit, cursed, and blamed God and everyone else but myself. I remember saying the rudest thing to my aunt for no reason one time. I wasn't a nice person to be around and I hated my life. Speak when you're angry and you will make the best speech you will ever regret. Ambrose Spears. Problems are a sign of life. Poor little white boy from suburbia who had skateboarding taken away. Normally I'd go skate around the city when I was angry, but I couldn't even do that. I started thinking of all the terrible things I could do. I thought about drinking or doing drugs, but I knew it wouldn't make me feel better. I felt like I'd just fallen into a dark pit and it took me months to climb out of it. I thought about my father who had committed suicide when things got tough. He didn't know how to handle it. I can't say I've never thought about it because the truth is when I was younger the idea ran through my mind a lot. At one point I even saw a psychiatrist to help me talk out some of the problems. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. There will always be problems no matter what stage of life you're at. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale said, Problems are a sign of life. The more problems you've got, the more alive you are. Many people run from problems instead of facing them. It's those that stick it out in the hard times and remain steady who grow. Suicide isn't the answer. Your life is worth living and we need you. I may have been in a dark place, but I wasn't a failure until I started blaming other people for my problems. Don't give up. When I think of perseverance, I think of the story of the tortoise and the hare, and how slow and steady wins the race. 
I think of marathon runners. I think about the kid whose parents gave him a brand new nice car versus the kid that worked all summer for it and bought it himself. I think of my widowed mom who selflessly raised two kids on her own. I think about getting bad news, falling down, negative thinking, and failing to achieve overly high expectations. And I especially think about being forced to rethink the entire strategy of your life due to unavoidable circumstances like an injury. In the last chapter, I talked about having the courage to start. And now I'm talking about something much harder. How to keep going. In my opinion, the reason you don't hear about some successful people for a very long time is because they were working so much. I used to tell myself that when I toured with a certain band, I had made it. Or if I sold a certain number of albums, I had arrived. But my personal definition of success kept changing, and so I kept striving for more, growing and getting better every day. I just kept going. There aren't many at the top because so many people give up along the way. Sometimes people tell me they quit music because they had to get a job. I say they quit because they couldn't handle it. It isn't mean, it's the truth. They wanted security, not success. And sometimes success takes a very long time. Take my music career, for example. This is how it started. The months following the accident, I just tried to stay busy and maybe meet a new girl, anything to keep my mind off skateboarding. One night, I was at a youth Christmas banquet at a church I'd been attending. It was a formal dinner set up with white linen dress tables facing the front of the room where a stage with speakers and a set of turntables stood in the middle. After dinner was served, the lights dimmed and suddenly a hip-hop performance exploded on the stage. I'd never seen a show like that before. The lights were flashing and the guys were running around the stage rapping. They looked like they were having a blast. My friends and I started dancing and throwing our hands up. Some dudes were even breakdancing. I was blown away. When the show was over, I introduced myself to the rap group and hung out with them. They were much older than me, but they put up with the dozens of questions I threw at them that night because I wanted to learn more about hip-hop. One night, they invited me over to listen to some records at their house, and they showed me how to write rap lyrics. They were buying tons of artist singles on vinyl that had only one or two songs on each side, plus the instrumental. They used the instrumental to write and record their own lyrics and songs. When they wanted to record, they'd have a record player plugged into a mixer with a microphone. They'd hit play on the record player and record onto the tape deck, wrapping songs into the mic. Then we'd play it back on the tape deck to hear how it sounded. I flipped through their entire collection of vinyl looking for a song with an instrumental track that I liked and started writing lyrics. There were so many albums and artists I'd never heard of. It was a whole new world. After this night, I started carrying a pocket-sized notebook with me at all times to write my rhymes in. This was my first introduction to hip-hop, and it was inspiring. My first introduction to music, on the other hand, was a completely different story. There's no F in music. Ever since I can remember, I liked music. Our family always encouraged listening and singing along to music as long as it was positive. At night, I'd lay in bed with my ghetto blaster next to me as I fell asleep playing Michael Jackson, the Beach Boys, or Alvin and the Chipmunks. I'd scan the radio at night for my favorite songs, and when I'd find one I liked, I'd hit record on the deck and I'd tape it onto a cassette. I remember going to my uncle's house for Christmas and being in awe of his giant vinyl collection. He'd make me mixtapes of songs to take home with me. When I was in third grade, I was the first kid who asked the teacher if I could bring my music to play during gym class. I felt pretty cool knowing I was the one who brought the party tunes while we ran around during gym warm-ups. One of the songs we'd all sing along to while running was Jerry Lee Lewis's Great Balls of Fire. The first time I picked up an instrument was the trumpet in fifth grade. I can still feel the excitement in the classroom as all the instruments were pulled out and the rush of synergy in the place as kids moved around. I remember a lot of the guys fighting over who got to play the drums. They allowed only one student out of 27 to play drums, and my friend was picked over the rest of us because he owned a set at home. The only instruments available then were clarinets, saxophones, trombones, flutes, trumpets, no guitars, basses, or turntables. At the time, I listened to a lot of Nirvana and Guns N' Roses. I loved the rebellion and attitude in their songs. Had my teacher come into class with a guitar and started playing Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana, the students' faces would have lit up instantly. I would have been like a fat kid in his cake, practicing all through the night, learning every riff to every song on the Nevermind album. I wish that was the case, but it wasn't. Instead, our teacher acted like a drill sergeant standing in front of her militia of 6th graders, all sitting in perfect rows. During test time, we'd sit silent with our sheet music in front of us, while one by one she would go down the line signaling each student to play. I remember one day it was my turn to play, and I saw my classmates giggling and passing around notes that said, It looks like Chris is French kissing his trumpet. I was so embarrassed. Sweat dripped down my forehead and my fingers shook as I pressed one wrong note after the next. 
I felt like bending that trumpet over my knee, twisting it into a slinky, and smashing it through the window. In that class, we weren't taught how to express ourselves or our emotions, and we were never allowed to experiment. We didn't write poems or song lyrics either. It was completely one-dimensional. So I learned the trumpet and was forced to play music I didn't enjoy. I couldn't get good at it. I even borrowed a trumpet from my friend Bruce so I could practice at home, but I wasn't any good. Now I see why it was so easy for someone like me to slip through the cracks when I didn't immediately connect with what they were teaching. Before the year was up, I had tried and failed to play every instrument available, with the saxophone being the worst experience. Even the theory of music wasn't becoming clear to me. One day my teacher pulled me aside and said, maybe music just isn't your thing. What kind of a teacher says that to a kid? I barely passed the course with a 52% and they gave it to me just so I wouldn't fail the whole grade. From then on, I never thought about playing music again. In fact, I was bitter about it. I can recall walking through the hallways of my high school and the sounds of the big band playing making my insides shudder. Now I just laugh because I've had what many would consider a successful music career. It's amazing how your whole life can be going in one direction and in a blink of an eye the gears shift and move completely the opposite way. You build on failure. You use it as a stepping stone. Close the door on the past. You don't try to forget the mistakes, but you don't dwell on it. You don't let it have any of your energy or any of your time or any of your space. Johnny Cash. Pay to play. I get funny looks when I tell my friends or other artists that I'm not getting paid for a show, but their eyes really pop out of their sockets when I tell them that not only am I not getting paid, but I also cover my own travel expenses. This is how the music industry works. Sometimes the only way to get on a larger tour is to buy on. To this day, I still buy on to bigger tours, and now bands are buying on to mine. Depending on the tour, it can be worth it, and you make a lot of new fans. On one tour, I paid $150 per show to the headlining band for a 15-minute slot, but it didn't include transportation, so I still had to pay another band to let me catch a ride in their van, on top of covering my own hotel costs. This was before I had a band and I traveled solo. So many nights I slept on hotel room floors to save money. To make matters worse, there were five bands on that bill, so we had very little time for setup, and I had to perform one or two songs in between the set changes. Every night, guys would disrupt my performance by coming on stage to plug in cables. They'd even bump into me while moving their gear around. It was absolutely ridiculous. Another time, I bought into another tour many years later and paid a thousand a night, plus covered my own travel, hotel, and bandmates. But unlike earlier ones, this tour was very successful and I would do it again in a heartbeat because I got to reach so many more fans and I was treated like a professional. If you can imagine it, right before I went on that tour, the company I had quit called me to offer me my job back with an even higher salary. The easy way was staring me right in the face like a golden apple on a platter. Fortunately, I knew if I took the job, I would be giving up too soon. I decided to take the road less traveled. 2 Corinthians 12.9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Sleeping by the side of the road less traveled. I will never forget my first tour across the United States with my friend Jeff Goring, driving from Toronto, Canada to Seattle, Washington. We were stuffed into a 2006 Pontiac Vibe along with our luggage, merchandise, and pillows like a tightly packed can of tuna. We had no GPS, just a map we picked up at a gas station and the road signs to guide our journey. Neither of us had ever done anything like this before, so we were super stoked. We drove into the sunset, watching the sky change colors on the horizon. We were like Batman and Robin on a mission into the unknown, leaving the Great White North and heading into the land of the Stars and Stripes. We took lots of pictures of the state signs and we had lots of time to do so because I think we took more U-turns and pulled off at more exits to ask for directions than on any other road trip I've taken. The music was blasting inside the car and kept the adrenaline pumping through our veins as we talked about the future. By 1am of the first day, we pulled over to the side of the road to sleep. We'd gone as far as we could and we were exhausted. It was a dark, dusty road with no light except for the moon. Every time a massive 18-wheeler sped past us, the car would shake, but I managed to find a comfortable spot with my pillow wedged against the driver's side door and was just about to fall asleep. That's when Jeff started moving around. He shifted position every 10 minutes. Finally, the racket he was making was too much. I lost my cool and yelled, You've got one minute to find a comfortable spot and go to sleep. This was our first day and the first of many frustrating moments we'd have while we lived together on the road for the next month. On this trip, we played lots of hot, nasty festivals surrounded by crowds with tattooed arms and spiky mohawks. 
We got a flat tire, got stranded in the desert, and yet we still managed to make it to our last stop in Quincy, California without killing each other. This part of my career definitely tested my perseverance, my patience, and my friendships. The worst memory I have of touring was in New Mexico playing a show. When I landed, nobody was there to pick me up, and I didn't bring a jacket because I thought I would be warm, but it wasn't. I ended up sleeping on a cold bench for hours, waiting for the promoter to come get me. When I did finally get picked up, I was a shivering, starving mess. The driver took me to get breakfast at a smoke-filled cafe to nourish my scrawny frame. When I finally arrived at the venue, my bandmates decided to play a joke on me. They hid all my merchandise in the van and trailer so I couldn't find it. I was only getting paid $35 for each show, and without my merchandise, I had no other way of making money. After searching for my stuff and questioning every bandmate, I gave up and wandered into my room by myself and turned out the lights. I broke down and cried like a baby. I once heard a friend say to a band, if you want to see if you're a tight-knit band, go on tour together. After the first tour, groups either break up or continue on for a lifetime. Almost there. We headed to our final show on the tour in Quincy at the Joshua Fest. We pulled into a campground a day early, and since there were no hotels, the parking area of the campground was our only option. Jeff had started calling me Grumpy Fest. He decided to make his bed outside with the chipmunks instead of spending another night crammed in the car with me. Jeff took his sleeping bag and pillow and lay down on the grassy floor under a starry night sky. It was quiet, and we were both fast asleep until about 3 a.m. when he woke up to a clicking noise. It was the sound of the sprinkler system going off. Within seconds, Jeff was soaked. I had locked the car door before nodding off, so Jeff spent five minutes banging on the car trying to wake me. He was not amused. Despite this, we played a great show on the main stage at Joshua Fest, and after signing autographs, we jumped into the car, I squeezed the steering wheel tightly, my eyes were focused on the task at hand, driving 16 hours straight to Vancouver, B.C., I was amped because I was going to see my wife for the first time in weeks, and we were just married. When I saw Melanie in Vancouver, it was like the heavens opened up, music started playing, and we ran to each other in slow motion, like a scene from a movie. I shared all the stories with her about being on the road, and we had some good laughs. Sometimes reward for perseverance is just being able to see your loved ones at the end of the journey. Stronger I remember one time early in my music career after I'd quit my job walking home from the grocery store with Melanie in a snowstorm because we had no car. Our fingers were bright red as we carried heavy bags of groceries back to our apartment. We had to count almost every item we purchased so we wouldn't go over our budget. In case there wasn't enough money in our account, it was so bad we had to laugh. We knew one day we'd look back and say, see, we didn't give up and look what God's done. We knew God had big things in store for us. As the scripture says, he who is faithful with little will be ruler over much. Luke 16.10 We just kept going. The man who wouldn't stop. I once heard a story of a 61-year-old Australian by the name of Cliff Young who entered an ultra-marathon in Australia that was over 500 miles long from Sydney to Melbourne. The day of the event, he walked into the registration area and was mistaken for a spectator, but when he received his racing number, it was clear he intended to compete. Critics thought it was a joke. Cliff Young told them that he was a farmer and was accustomed to running down his sheep night after night, sometimes running for three days straight to keep up with them. He was confident he would not only enter the race, but win it. The younger contestants thought they'd all leave the 61-year-old in the dust. The race began, and sure enough, the marathoners took off in a dash, leaving Cliff Young behind. But after a couple of nights, some of the runners stopped to rest while Cliff ran on. He shuffled on and on, keeping a steady pace, denying himself sleep for five days and maneuvering himself into first place to win the race. Cliff Young became a world-class athlete and a national hero in 1983 at 61. Some of the runners who were pulled off of the race for medical treatment gave interviews from the hospital, hiding under the sheets and essentially saying the same thing, how do you beat a man who doesn't stop? When I heard the comment, how do you beat a man that doesn't stop, it rang true in my heart and did something to me. Whenever I think that I can't go on anymore, God whispers in my ear, keep going, boy, I'm with you, and I get up and go again. Pressing on. What do you do when you're knocked down again and again? What do you do when your dreams start to fade? Do you quit and say forget it? These were the questions I asked myself. The longer I stayed down, the harder it was to get back up. That's why I pulled myself up and reached for another dream. Perseverance is not taking no for an answer. Perseverance is knocking on the door, and if no one answers, then kicking it down. 
Perseverance is reaching while others are falling. Perseverance is getting back up again and again. I don't know where you're at today or what your story is, but can I dare you to take another step? Can I dare you to keep moving and give it another shot? I'm living my dream because I persevered. Longevity is a key component to success. I had to reinvent myself around playing music instead of skating. I had to push through financial hardship and put in the hard work before I got my reward. I always wanted to live in California and skate. I'm not skating for a career, but I'm definitely in California skating. It took me 12 years for my dream to manifest, but I'm standing in it right now, and that's an amazing thing. I'm not the smartest or most talented person in the world, but I succeeded because I keep going and going and going. Sylvester Stallone Action Steps Life doesn't always go the way we planned. When I was 18 years old, my skateboarding career came to a halt. If you were in a similar circumstance and your career took a sharp turn or suddenly ended, what would you do? Take time and write that down right now. Number two, my biggest challenge right now is writing my first book. What is the biggest challenge in your life at the moment? Now list three ways you can respond positively to it. Write those down right now.